Well, good afternoon. Um, I won't be mentioning the words blockchain or ETL, though I'm passionate about both. We're going to be talking about the porting of FIBO ontologies over to the web via schema.org and the W3C, which is the, for those who might not know, is the standards body for the World Wide Web. So this is where FIBO ontologies meet web publishing standards. And I think that maybe in a week or two, the FIBO standard for web publishing will be live through schema.org. But happily, we're going to show you in a few moments some live examples of the FIBO ontology ported to schema.org live. And for those of you who don't know, schema.org for about four and a half years ago, Richard, um, was the, web uh, the new web publishing standard declared by Google, Bing, Yahoo, and Yandex, and a few other search engines. So that's what we're going to we're going to rock into. We're going to try to be as concise and as fast as possible because we have a lot of content to show you. So I'll give it up to Richard. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I'm an independent consultant. I spend a lot of time with the World Wide Web community, uh, running um, community groups around um, bibliographic data. I've got a background in bibliographic data, uh, archives data, FIBO for the finance area, tourism. I'm even involved in some work around educational courses and how they could be described on the web. Uh, I'm currently working uh, on the contract to Google, helping them with schema.org, the vocabulary itself, the site that helps people share information about it, extending it, documenting it, and encouraging organizations to um, in, in, involve themselves in the environment. Uh, I, I do some work for OCLC, Global Library Cooperative, 27,000 libraries worldwide, but you don't want to know about that. And I'm also part of the FIBO group, bringing um, FIBO to schema.org. So schema.org, I'm um, quite often asked, where the hell did that come from? Well, it, it came from a blog post on Google on the 2nd of June, 2011, when uh, Google, Bing, and Yahoo, very rapidly followed by Yandex, introduced this new markup standard for structured data on the web, moving on from HCARD and VCARD and one or two other micro formats that were around. Uh, it introduced many new types, including creative works, books, music recordings, TV series, being able to describe embedded objects like audio and video, events, organizations, people, places, local businesses, restaurants, exercise parlors, products uh, and offers on those products, um, reviews and aggregations. It, the main use case they pointed it at is something called rich snippets, the ability not necessarily to affect where a result appeared in, in, in the listings on the search engine, but what it looked like when they showed it you. In, uh, being able to bring ratings into their been able to bring reviews into their uh, images, et cetera, et cetera. So what is it? It's a linked data vocabulary uh, using RDF triples, using URIs and strings. So I quite happily put the little linked data, uh, three blue balls. Who thought that up? I don't know, but never mind. Logo in the bottom corner. But notice I put the words linked data in brackets. The reason for this is they don't shout about it. It's difficult to find those words on the schema.org site. And that's because to most of the people who are going to be applying this vocabulary, webmasters, web designers, linked data, that's the semantic web and scary and it'll never catch on. So, you know, uh, we, we keep away from it. It's, it's got types, we refer to types rather than classes, properties, enumeration values. Uh, this is where people like you who are into RDF and ontology start to get worried. So this is a scary bit for you lot, is that it's not domain and range, it's range and domain includes. This is kind of hinting at relationships, not 
asserting relationships. But we'll see what happens further on. Three serializations. So if I'm a web designer and I want to put schema.org on my site, I've got a choice of microdata, RDFA, and JSON-LD. And there's more column inches on, on uh, web lists arguing about which one's the best of those than, than goes on forever. Religious wars, especially between the microdata and RDFA people. It doesn't make any difference. Schema.org works in all of them. So the bottom line is it's a web vocabulary. Notice I'm using the word vocabulary, not ontology. It's a web vocabulary to describe stuff and any old stuff. It could be anything from your lunch to uh, where you're going on holiday to the space rocket that's just been thrown into the sky. It's a general purpose vocabulary. So where did it come from? It's like most things on the web, it's built on what went before. So the schema.org family tree, and this, you know, things merge, but a family tree will do, has got sort of linked data, semantic web, and RDF at the top, which is obviously based around original web standards. Down the bottom, we've got HTML5, we've got microdata, we've got RDFA, we've got JSON-LD, microformats, going down to things like RSS, HTML. Most of these things are under the banner of the, of, of the World Wide Web. We've got Dublin Core, one of the very early vocabularies, but that traces its history back to the libraries. 1968, the machine readable catalog card. The, the heritage is in here. So somebody who was saying that we needed librarians in this industry, we've been here since 1968. Um, the World Wide Web Consortium has been associated or maintains the standards or runs the bodies that's behind all of this. And, and as was said earlier by Shannon, W3C is OMG for the web, I would say. Um, so where did it first come from? 1989, March. A little paper called Information Management, a proposal by a certain Mr. Tim Berners-Lee at the time, was presented to his boss, and it disappeared. In, in, inside CERN. He was working in CERN labs in Switzerland at the time. And eventually, after several months, it came back with this now infamous scroll on the top that says, vague but exciting. And I think that's the best description of the web I've ever heard and is still valid today. He moved on from that we, um, as the web started to establish, mid-1990s. Uh, we, we were involved with uh, the, the CERN web server and Netscape appeared and all that kind of stuff. 2001, this article in Scientific American appeared, which introduced the semantic web. Uh, the beginnings of this are still in his original paper, but this is where he was expressing them. And th there was a bit of a problem here, because I think the guy that did the cover photo read the conclusions and what this might lead to, not the actual article. So putting a computer with, I know what you mean written on it, on the front cover, fired off more artificial intelligence projects in computer science departments than you could shake a stick at. They were all off doing semantic web things. They were all off playing with RDF, producing prototypes that worked beautifully till you logged a second user into your Cray computer. Um, you know, it went off at a tangent. It helped the standards get established. It helped uh, URIs, it helped RDFA, it helped Sparkle and those kind of things, but it was not much practical use to the wider world. So Tim pops up again, this time in 2009 in a TED talk called The Next Web. Well worth a watch, even though it was 2009, where he explains by taking the standards that had been established and worked on by all these AI guys, and applying them for practical reasons, we could actually do something useful. This was linked data. And it led with uh, a group of people starting to take these principles up and sharing their data on the web using linked data principles to the now infamous open linked data cloud diagram. Who hasn't seen this? Precisely. So great, really impressive. Hundreds and hundreds of data sets from different industries, different sectors, universities, etc., all shared using raw RDF principles, using different vocabularies, uh, Dublin Core, Bibo, all sorts of uh, vocabularies to describe this stuff. 
very often based using Sparkle on Sparkle endpoints. If you want to go and get some data on one of those sources, you don't need to understand an API. It's open link data and inevitably got Sparkle on the top. But again, impressive, but to the rest of the world, really useful. Um, in some cases, yes. Um, DBpedia giving you Wikipedia in this format is handy. Geo names giving you locations, yeah, that's handy. But the vast majority of this stuff to the vast majority of the world, not really a lot of use, even though it is impressive. The next thing that came along was another blog post from Google, 16th of May 2012, introducing something called the knowledge graph, talking about things, not st strings, which is starting to get into what we've been talking about for the last couple of days. It introduced the knowledge graph. The first example of this we started to see on the right-hand side of Google search pages. When they can identify an entity that you were talking about, they'd put you a page up. Very often, uh, entertainment or things like that, or more serious things that might interest people in this room, you never know. Describing an entity with information pulled from many places. And these ent entities were related together. So Bart Simpson being related to Nancy Cartwright, who's related to Dayton, Ohio, who's related to a really good Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, if you've got a spare data to a while away in Ohio. Well worth the visit, and it's free. But anyway, these relationships are not from a, a restricted set. So we have Bart System, who is played by Nancy Cartwright, who happens to be born in Dayton, Ohio, and happens to have a place of interest relationship with this Air Force Museum. That, that set of relationships is now into the hundreds of thousands within Google. They are relationships that they identify to build their knowledge graph. So where do they get this data from? When they started, they seeded it with a data set called Freebase. Freebase is uh, an RDF-based open um, data set that people have been throwing data into for years. They got it when they, um, they purchased the organization behind it. They get data from search results. When they're really, really sure what a page is about, they'll say that's an entity and put it in their data set. They pull information from Wikipedia originally, more so now, they pull it from Wikidata, which is a data set behind all the facts in, in Wikipedia. And they pull in it from schema.org. So what do they do with it? Well, what they do is process it through their little pipeline and pour the entity descriptions into their knowledge graph. And by they, you mean search yes. Uh, and, and, and every time I say Google, treat it as a collective noun. There are other search engines. <laughs> So what do they use that for? It then drives the knowledge graph. It provides the facts and the relationships in the knowledge panel display. It also powers info boxes. If you search for a specific thing in one of these search engines, very often you'll get a panel which talks about that thing with some links around. It's a more interactive, more rapid response process with the user. Also, some of the facts are pull out to supply answers. So if you ask how high Mount Everest is, they will give you a box with a quick answer and some nice pictures and some navigation. It's still also powering the main use case originally, which was, um, hang on, we, what happened there? Oh, look, my computer is telling me there's a new version of Java. I think we'll, <laughs> we, will, we will skip that version. Right, good, fine. <laughs> so, so it's still handling this rich snippets use case. Um, some people say, where does this fit in with whatever's going on? You may have heard of something called the Google ranking brain, which is kind of artificial intelligence pulling signals from all sorts of places. The knowledge graph is, is a comp key component of that. So this is driving the way the future goes. Anyway, schema.org is one of these sources. Schema.org is a success. Why do I say it's a success? Well, first off, its data is embedded in website HTML using microdata, RDFA, or JSON-LD. It's not a challenge for people to share this data with the search engines, which means it's harvested during the normal web crawls. The search engines don't have to do anything special to go and, this, go and get this data. They just use what they've been doing before. And it's under the control of the site publisher. So when 
When a price changes, you change the schema.org structured data behind the page when you want to. The next crawl comes in and picks up that fact. They haven't got to analyze the text on the page and kind of work out that this bit might be the price and is it different to what it was before? And You can certainly give them facts. And this success is now reflected in usage. At the end of last year, it was identified that over 12 million websites are using schema.org. Another way to view that is in a 10 billion page sample that Google, and not a collective noun this time, did, they analyzed and identified 30% of those pages had schema.org markup in them. That's a hell of a lot of the web that's adopted this. So, all very interesting, but why is it relevant to us? Why are we bothering with it? What, why are our organizations worried about that context? Why should they be worried? Well, if, if I say to you, website, I imagine something like this gets conjured up. Maybe a little bit prettier. But most of the people assume when we're talking about the web, it looks like this. Well, actually, that view of the world is falling into disuse. It's not being used as often. You get this view. So if I type in ATM into my phone, I get this. I get a map of the local ATMs. I get a list of them. So there's one at Bank of America not far away. So using information from the banks, Google are providing answers to my potential users without them having to touch my website. They're going directly to them. They're, they're having the conversation with my user, which allows them to come use my ATM. Increasingly, users are interacting with watches and other mobile devices directly into systems. People are starting to talk to their computers. You know, hey Siri is, is, is what goes on here. And let me, a little aside here, I was rehearsing this presentation because it takes hell of a lot of rehearsing to get it into the time I've got. In my room the other day, and I got my iPhone on the table timing it. And I came to this slide and I said, people will say, hey Siri, where can I get some cash? And this is what happened, or should do. <sighs> Come on, my sound's gone. No? Okay. All right, I'll, I can play that back to people later if, um, hang on, will it work? No, it's not going to work. So, Come on, let's go back one. Hey Siri, where can I get some cash? Okay, one option. I see nearby is Bank of America ATM on North Harbour Drive. Do you want that one? Yes, please. Great. I can call that location or get directions to it. What would you like me to do? Directions. So that, that was me in my hotel room on the seventh floor here, interacting with the data that's in the knowledge graph of the search engines. Nowhere near a website. Now, OK, that's simple data, locations of branches and ATMs. But, hey, Siri, where can I get a loan to buy my house with? Hey, Siri, what bank account gives me a good overdraft level? You, you can hear where that direction is going to go. But they need the information to provide it. So this is where schema.org becomes important. I'm going to give you a very, very brief uh, tour through as, uh, the way the library world did this a couple of years ago. Librarians really understand their data, just like you lot. They're good at cooperation, just like you lot. Early schema.org, when they looked at it, was useful, but not good enough for their purposes. So they, well, actually, I formed a World War Web Consortium group called Schema Bib Extend. We identified public data sharing uh, use cases, knowledge graph, like we talked about. And unusually, we didn't start off with our vocabulary on ontology and try and put that into schema.org. We said, what can we do with schema.org now? Then fill in the gaps. You end up with a much shorter list of things to do, and you tend to fit in with the rest of the world. We created real examples, proposed enhancements to the core vocabulary, proposed a more focused extension, which became bibschema.org. And it took a couple of years to get there. Other groups that have done this, the automotive group, set up a W3C group, minor enhancements to the core, now there's an auto schema.org extension. The medical group put a load of terms in. In fact, they overwhelmed schema.org, and they're coming out into an extension. They're not being dropped. 
Sports, news, TV and radio, they threw their stuff in and that's validly part of schema.org. So, bibo.schema.org was to take this approach. We have a great amount of information about the entities in the financial world. How are we going to describe them to the outside world so that the search engines can direct our potential customers to the loans and the bank accounts and the credit cards and the other facilities uh, that they want to take account of. We, we put this together uh, in, the, in the fall last year and we've now got the beginnings of financingschema.org and this is a proposal for the core. Just like the other groups, we've identified some generally useful terms that could go into the core of schema.org. One of them's loan and credit. Uh, you get a schema.org page about it. You get some examples of how to use it. I think that one's in RDFA, but we do them in all examples. And, and the set that we put in, bank account, no bank account in schema.org. Hey, <laughs> currency conversion service, deposit account, financial products, uh, payment services, payment cards, things like that, has gone in. And this is the real life, not live, but captured, that, we're, uh, that Chris was talking about earlier. This is uh, Bank of California lending page. Loans, three types of loans talked about there. To, to Google, in its original form, that's a page that just talks about loans. That's all it is. But by embedding schema.org markup, and this time in JSONLD, it identifies four entities on that page. Three types of loan, a bank that is offering them, and the relationships between them. Now, big pieces of information, but quite small. Here is the offered by of a particular loan type by the Bank of California for a residential loan. So where are we with this? Core proposals uh, which have gone into the schema.org candidate release for the next version. At three minutes past two this afternoon, I received the email to say it's in there and the candidate release has been released within schema.org. And within one to two weeks, we expect that candidate release to actually become schema.org 3.0, which includes the, the, the basis for the financial terms coming from fiber. In the background, we're working on an extension to schema.org, which is very financially focused, building on the foundations of the core terms. So we're talking about things like brokerage accounts, mortgage loans, repayment specifications, that kind of thing, that generally in schema.org, ooh, that's a bit detailed. So we'll put it in a, uh, in a, in a FIBO extension. And eventually, after a few iterations of FIBO.schema.org, we expect an external extension, which will be... It's got a running title which confuses the hell out of everybody and we must change it, uh, of schema 50.org which will be vocabulary, 12 million users, 30% of pages, what the search engines ask for. If you go to Google and say, how do I mark my pages up? They'll tell you schema.org. Finance and banking was poorly represented, but now through fiber initiatives, it's ensuring not only visibility of the terms, but visibility to the users who can use them, enabling the kind of practical application which we just showed you. Core proposals plus the schema.org will make financial terms based on FIBO integral to the knowledge graphs that the search engines are building, core to the new direct access web, the, the Hey Google, Hey Su, uh, Siri environment, marketing directly to where the users are so that your bank can market its financial products to the people that are looking for them. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Chris, because I need to lie down. <laughs> You're a little tired, huh? Thanks to my dear friend Richard for walking us, running us through this. So let's see here. You made a few changes to the deck, didn't you, Richard? So in this case, uh, BNP Paribas is a, a member of the EDMC. And one of its subsidiaries is Bank of the West. They have 800 branches west of the Mississippi here in the United States and North America. They will be shortly implementing some of the code that Richard has talked about. Uh, specifically, they asked me to, um, 
they asked my, my company, they asked me, uh, Caliber Media Group, to implement JSON-LD for their credit cards. So pretty soon on their main credit cards webpage, well, uh, the HTML along with HTML5 embedded with JSON-LD uh, structured data um, as, uh, as uh, uh, retrieved, uh, uh, which, is a, which will be an, out, an outcome of the work that the EDMC has done with schema.org for porting FIBO ontologies over to uh, schema.org vocabularies. I know it sounds kind of complicated, but if you could just play along, that would be super. <clears throat> Um, not sure why we have this slide uh, after the fact, Richard, but uh, this is the DBpedia. So DBpedia often serves as a URI within JSON-LD schema, uh, which is then put into HTML. Any webmasters at all in the audience today? Okay. I got one. <laughs> this is Freebase. By the way, Google owns Freebase, and Freebase is being deprecated, so it's kind of no longer being updated at all. Instead, uh, uh, Freebase is being ported over to Wikidata, and Richard and I, over dinner last night, uh, you gave me some fuzzy answer about when it's really going to be ported over. It's in flight. Yeah. Not very only they're in the process of transferring all the concepts that will fit into Wikidata from Freebase. Ooh. I reckon by the end of the year. Ooh, okay. Um, currently, we do have live examples. Bank of California. Bank of the West is coming up, um, which will contain FIBO the FIBO version of schema.org. Uh, currently, and I know a gentleman, a great friend of mine uh, who's in attendance here. Hello, Mark. Um, CETA Insurance, which is a subsidiary of Brown & Brown, very large insurance company. They're, they're starting to deploy um, my, our code um, onto their pages. That is FIBO schema.org compliant. So they're jumping ahead of the curve, but I know that our version one of FIBO for schema dot, the, the FIBO schema.org extension is going to be go, uh, going live um, shortly. And I also have a credit union where I'll be placing the code, where my team will be inserting the code. It's a California um, federal uh, credit union. And so this is the future of the web. This is the future of the web publishing standard for the financial industry. So this is basically, this session basically is a big FYI. Um, I highly advise you to get on this bus and get your CMO to get on this bus. And by the way, at the end of this, uh, at the end of this session, the San Diego uh, Semantic Web Meetup group is having a secondary session to talk about the SEO implications, search engine optimization implications, of this rolling out of the FIBO extension to schema.org. It'll be in the Ale House, which is like, once you walk down, hang a left here, and you walk down a little bit more, it's the first restaurant that's right in the lobby of the hotel. And um, coincidentally, um, three of the members of the um, EDMC FIBO extension to schema.org working group, uh, we've decided to form an international coalition because, uh, or a consortium, because um, this is going to, the implications for GSIBs, everybody know what a GSIB is? All right, the implications for GSIBs is going to be, um, 
well, just this is an overhaul all, of all web publishing, and we wanted to hit GSIBs and help GSIBs transform their web publishing to adhere to this new standard, version 1, version 1.1, 1.2, version 2. And uh, three of the folks on the, uh, on the EDMC, FIBO, schema.org extension working group um, we've decided to come together and work together. And so that would include uh, me and uh, this charming fellow, young fellow who just spoke, and also Mako Lab, which is also working hand in hand with the ADMC in order to facilitate um, uh, this code coming to being, and that's Mako Lab. Unfortunately, um, our dear friend Mirak Sopek couldn't be with us today. He is, he seems to be, uh, he's hung up in Gainesville, Florida at the moment with a client, but he is based in Eastern Europe. And uh, what else do I have to say? Um, thank you, and do you have any questions? Thank you, and please ask a question. No questions at all. Ian? Richard, how long do you think, what's the inside story on how long till we get released? The, um, the 3.0, 3.0, I've got my brain on backwards, sorry, uh, version of schema.org, one okay. to two weeks. And there's a, there's a steering group that reviews the release candidates, and unless there's some major showstoppers that upsets the sensibilities of anybody on the committee, uh, we expect one to two weeks. So by the end of the month, I would imagine. Now, it's live and they're harvesting it, and because it's built on broader schema.org, already there's a lot of terms that are in there that they're recognizing. Right. So I. I deployed Extant um, uh, for one client. They wanted, to, um, they wanted to change their search engine optimization from being on page seven for flexible business loans, flexible commercial loans, flexible residential loans, because that's, their, that's what they do. So we deployed the customary code, got them from page seven to being on page one position position one for flexible commercial loans, business loans, and residential loans. That's the Bank of California. Uh, actually, it, it, uh, Elisa, it, it took a week. Okay, so it took a while. That's not long. That's not long. And then what we've done is add, we've, added, we've jumped ahead of the official FIBO release for schema.org and embedded that code anticipating that um, the, the code will get released into schema.org and will then be um, understood by Googlebot and Bingbot, uh, which are the only two search engines I care about. And uh, it hasn't hurt their rankings. They're still, they're still stick, sticking at number one. Um, so Google is, 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 Googlebot and Bingbot are ignoring the, the additional FIBO code but we wanted to write the code before it got released because uh, who knows when it's going to be released? One or two weeks. One more question. Back in the back. Um, the reason, yes. Well, we're, we're coming at this problem from two ends. FIBO is uh, mapping and modeling and producing the ontology around detailed forms. We're taking the schema.org way of describing things to, uh, uh, to describe those same two entities. Over time, they will start to map together. And some of the things we've described in FIBO.schema.org are not yet mapped in FIBO and, and vice versa. So as the releases come together and we move to more in-depth extensions and eventually that external extension I was talking about, that mapping will become closer and closer. But they, uh, the granularity of schema.org is far more coarse than you would expect inside, inside FIBO. So don't expect every property in your ontology to turn up in schema.org. 
because it won't. So, at, at, but we are working to uh, align conceptually as much as we possibly can the terminology in schema.org with terminology and the concepts in FIBO. So the folks in FIBO are participating and vetting the terminology so that we have that alignment. Eventually, we will have a, a bridge so that we'll be able to utilize uh, machine capabilities to transition across. Let's give these guys a hand for you.